Okay, team, the rover has landed. <laughs> Mission Control at Western University in London, Ontario. From this room, they're simulating a rover landing on the moon. Did, that, did you send that word? Okay. Most of the students here are PhD candidates in geology or planetary science. Okay, so now that it's landed, what's the first command that we want to send to the rover? The goal of the training is to practice real-time communications with a rover. And we would like to drive there, please. Cassandra Marion is in charge. Right now, the tactical science team is in a discussion over what they want to ask the rover to do next. Take a panorama. Take a panorama. And how realistic are you trying to make this? As realistic as possible. I mean, the whole objective of the mission is to design operations for real moon exploration. Okay, so we're now just waiting for our panorama image to be taken. But how is it that these students even want to go to the moon? I mean, none of them were born when the Apollo mission landed 50 years ago. So should we drive up there? Cassandra tells me that doesn't matter at all. Apollo paved the way for the future of human exploration. I don't think you get more inspirational than that than being able to touch another planetary body in the solar system. It's the first time that we've stepped off the planet and walked somewhere else. Would you go? Yes. <laughs> of course I would like to go. <laughs> yeah. There we go. How close to the second landing site is this? As part of the training, Sarah Simpson studies the terrain around the landing site. It could well, also be some this, sort of alteration. This one is the... She's here precisely because, to her, the Apollo missions are ancient history, the last one being in 1972. Oh, that's right. It comes yeah. up, yep, you're right. Wow. I'm more frustrated that we haven't done anything since <laughs> then. It's been so long, and we, I mean, we, ha we haven't been back since then. Um, you know, we have all these great technologies, and we have the ability to go up to other places in our solar system, but we still haven't done that. And you want to change that? I would love to, yeah. Okay, we have a confirmation that we did receive the Pong command from the rover as well, so all communication is good. Spend any time in mission control here, and it strikes you how seriously the students take the training. Uh, Jen, yes. the annotated Supercam picture has been sent. Okay. Take Jennifer Newman, whose job it is to relay commands to the rover. Okay, your traverse to the hallway has been sent. Okay. All right. What's your goal, you know, in your career? Actually, this is kind of what I would like to do sometime. If I could be involved in controlling the rover and just exploring these new worlds, um, I think that would be my dream job. So your zooms are down here, and this is your orientation. Well, space missions don't happen overnight. It takes time and planning and commitment. And it did not turn red. Should it turn red? And so it makes sense that the young people of today will be the ones to make it happen. Here in Nadim is the president of Students for the Exploration and Development of Space. I met her at the Moon exhibit at Toronto's Aga Khan Museum. We're trying to elevate the student voice for space in Canada. There's a lot of people up in government talking about what to do about space. There's a lot of companies talking about the need for space uh, and retaining that in Canada, but they're not like focusing on the next generation as much. And now we Space exploration used to be a very exclusive club, top secret projects led by governments. Take the Apollo missions. They were fueled by competition between the Americans and the Russians. Here it says that shouldn't be the future. I think we need to be open to collaborating to get anything done. There's something very comforting about knowing that it's not just you know Canadians, it's not just the Americans, it's the whole world, and we can all work on one project together. Looks like our traverse has failed to complete. Okay. Got it. Leah Sachs tells me as much as she was inspired by Apollo, she hopes the next time things are different. You had about one woman really involved in mission control originally when you landed for Apollo, compared to this entire room, there's maybe well, there's only one man in the room at the moment. Does that matter to you? Yeah, it definitely matters to me. Um, as a woman in science, um, you know, I want to make sure that I'm going to be paid the same as my male colleagues, that I'm not going to be, you know, have my scientific opinions judged based on the fact that I'm a woman that's 
I would rather, much rather be judged on the actual science. If it works out there, then... For the next part of the exercise, Christy Cottle will act as the rover outside. We are going to be the rover, so we'll have handheld science instruments and taking actual measurements in the field and doing actual images. With all the technical details and the calculations. So this is our, our calm link, if you will. It's easy to forget the primal reasons we have for going to space. For me, it's more about moving us forward as a whole, as humanity, right? Um, and space exploration represents some of the best that humans have to offer. We're curious and we're, we're explorers. We have to know and we have to um, understand our place in the larger cosmos. Christy explains that going to space can help us look at our own planet in a different way. As in everything else we do, and we go to space really to learn about ourselves because ultimately that's what we're seeking. We're wondering what is our place. Okay, so our drive is complete. Yep. Earth is so precious and just we need to be very aware of what's most important to us right now. And if we can get any other uh, perspective to help us see the Earth in a different way and help us to understand that we're all here, we're all in it together, and we need to protect what's here and understanding what is of immediate concern and what's important, and that's our home. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. All, right. All right, gang, I'm gonna call an end to the rover test for today, but thank you very much. 50 nice. years later, these are the daughters and sons of Apollo. Where will they have taken us 50 years from now? Thanks, team. Give yourself a hand. Nick Purden, CBC News, London, Ontario. Now, if the Apollo moon landing inspires space explorers even now, imagine the moment itself 50 years ago, televised across the world, an estimated 500 million people watched it. And the next day, CBC cameras were out asking Canadians about their impressions. The answers, sometimes surprising. I think just a stunt and that's it. Doesn't impress you at all, does Not it? Not very much. I think that if man keeps on going as he is, he's going to destroy himself later, the years to come. What's out there, well, it was put there for not for us to know about. Maybe there's special stuff on the moon. It's a lot of days to get there. You think you might visit the moon? Yeah, I might, but I might not. Do you want? Yes. Do you think you will? No. Why not? Because I'm not a boy. Now those words, because I'm not a boy, a pretty crushing indictment of the gender bias of the times. But the trend, of course, these days has been towards equality, even if not always at rocket speed. Valentina Tereshkova, now seven and a half hours in orbit. And Another first for the Soviet Union. When Soviet Russia put the first woman in space in 1963, it was considered a trivial propaganda exercise. The Soviet press says she has brown hair and is slim, that her favorite flowers are daisies and gladioli, that her favorite lipstick is a thing called Moscow Red. 20 years later, NASA's first female astronaut still felt pressure to prove she deserved to be up there. There are a lot of people in the world, and there are some of them at NASA who are maybe reserving judgment. Following him is payload specialist Roberta Bondar. Bonder. The first Canadian woman in space had to work towards her goal, hoping society would catch up with her. I just wanted to be there at the right time with the right skill set. And, and I was more qualified in academically than anyone else who was selected for the program. I just felt that I had the right stuff. Now, roughly a third of NASA's astronaut corps is female. But while it's clear women are equally suited for space, space isn't always suited for them. During the Apollo days, spacesuits were custom tailored for all those trailblazing men. The space shuttle era was off the rack, so to speak, with standardized sizes. And it was then determined, partially because of costs, that we should decrease the number of suits. So the extra small, small, and extra large suits were, were removed. Some of our male astronauts stated that they couldn't get into their uh, large suits, so the extra large were brought back, which made it very challenging for female astronauts who tended to wear more of the smaller, extra small suit. As space veteran Katie Coleman told us, that meant tapping into a sisterhood of orbital problem solvers. 
I had some really great advice um, from some of the other women astronauts who had done spacewalks before about how to adapt the suit to basically take a suit that was kind of big and make it work for me. What we have now is a clarion call that we can do better. And the opportunity to do better is coming quickly. NASA committed to putting the first woman on the moon in five years.